As we've looked at the Sermon on the Mount, we've been in a section that talks about how really, in some ways, God's kingdom, our relationship that we have with him in this life and in eternity to come is something that is secretive. Now, many things about our walk with God are out in the open. We're supposed to be salt and we're supposed to be light, but there are certain aspects of our Christian faith that are things that are best left between us and God. We're seeking God's approval, not necessarily to draw attention to ourselves. And so this week, we're on the second aspect of God's secret kingdom, and that's looking at secret prayer from Matthew chapter 5, verses 5 to 15. Probably one of the times in my life that was most instrumental for me as far as my prayer life was when I separated from where I'd grown up and I went up to a different university. This is a Christian university. And as I was getting familiar with the campus, uh, the different buildings where my classes would be, our dormitories, our cafeterias, and just, just learning the map of our campus, I came across a small church-like building and I said, what is that? And someone came up to me and they said, that's, that's the prayer chapel. It was a small church that had been constructed mainly for the purpose of prayer. That was its purpose. And so we would walk inside occasionally, and there were a few rows of wooden pews and a small room at the back. Uh, outside, there was a courtyard, just a very small courtyard with two stone benches and a fountain. So it was a very peaceful, very private place. And I had an opportunity after classes to go over there many different days and just spend time developing my relationship with God which is something that really hadn't been a part of my life up until that point. And so God and I began to talk and have conversations, and I actually felt like I was developing a friendship with the God of the universe. But it took a place where I could get away in secret and go to pray on a consistent basis. And that's what Jesus is challenging all of us as his followers to pursue in our lives in today's message in Matthew chapter 6. Again, we're looking at the subject of secret prayer. And in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about three different aspects of our secret prayer. And that first aspect is something that I discovered years ago at college through the prayer chapel, and that's solitude, finding a quiet, separate place to improve my relationship with God. Jesus begins this way in verse 5, and when you pray, and when you pray, that word when, it really literally is whenever. And so Jesus wasn't saying that, that prayer is only reserved for certain times of a day or a certain schedule. Prayer is a whenever type of experience with God. And we, as believers in Christ, as people who are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, we have the opportunity to worship God in spirit and in truth whenever and wherever we are. We can come before him in our hearts and pray. Now that having been said, in Jewish culture at this time, prayer was both a scheduled event and a spontaneous occurrence. So there was a daily prayer schedule, a rhythm, a routine that was in the Jew's life at this point in time, and we'll mention that in just a moment. And prayer was also a spontaneous thing that could happen. You could be joyful, or you could be in need, or your heart could cry out to God at different moments throughout the day. So it wasn't just a schedule. There was spontaneity about it. But it was customary for Jews to gather two times daily to pray, at 9 a.m. and at 3 p.m., both of those times. Now, why 9 a.m. and 3 p.m.? Well, in Jewish culture, those times coincided with two different sacrifices that were made at the temple in Jerusalem. And so Jewish people living in Jerusalem at that point in time, they would collectively gather. The temple gates were open at 9 a.m. And so they would walk through into the courtyards and they would have a special time of prayers. The first morning sacrifice was offered, and as the incense offering, a sweet-smelling mixture of aromas rose up from inside the sanctuary. And that incense offering actually represents the prayers of the saints, different places in Scripture. And so as those incense uh, smokes were rising, their prayers would be rising before God as well at nine in the morning. Then they would reconvene around three o'clock in the afternoon because that's when a burnt offering, the last burnt offering sacrifice or the main burnt offering sacrifice of the day was offered. And that was known as the hour, hour of prayer. And so Jews would gather then. It doesn't mean that they prayed for an hour, but those two times a day were built into their schedules. If they didn't live in Jerusalem near the temple, they would just pause where they were and spend some time in prayer at nine o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon, those hours of prayer. We can see that in Luke chapter 1 uh, with people gathered at the hour of incense in the morning and in Acts chapter 3 with Peter and John going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. 
Jesus continues in the Sermon on the Mount. He says, you shall not be like the hypocrites. We talked about hypocrites last week. Hypocrites are the pretenders. Hypocrites in Greek culture were the actors, the people in theater who took on different roles on stage. Don't be like the pretenders. It says, for they love to pray standing. Now for us, standing would be a little bit presumptuous. It might draw some extra attention. But in Jewish culture, everyone prayed standing, oftentimes with their hands lifted to heaven. So the standing posture wasn't the hypocritical aspect of what Jesus was talking about. The hypocritical part comes next. He says, don't, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street so they can be seen by men. The synagogues acted like a hub, like a community center during the week. And they were places of worship on Saturday and places of education for kids and religious teaching throughout the week. And so being a community center, people came in and out. So if you went to the synagogue to pray, chances are your prayer would be uh, interrupted or or intersected by a group of people coming in, and they'd be able to observe your spirituality. Praying on the street corners would do the same thing. In fact, even in our culture, the street corners, those are the intersections. If you want to advertise pizzas for sale or you want to ask for money from people, you normally go to the street corners. People are going both ways, so you get double the exposure And so hypocrites, people who wanted to pray for the wrong motives, wanted to pray for attention, would be focused on those public places where they would come across as many people as possible to watch them be spiritual. He says that they may be seen. And that term seen that Jesus used, it's a little bit more than literally looked at. The term in Greek is talking about being shined upon. And so it's people notice you. When they notice you, a smile comes to their face. They think, Wow, that person is incredibly spiritual. They must be so spiritual because they're praying on the street corners or they're praying in the synagogue. Let's watch them pray. Wow, dear, look at that holy person over there praying. But they're doing it with the wrong heart motive. They're doing it to be seen by men for attention. Jesus says next, assuredly, I say, they have their reward. They have it. That's what they were looking for. Prayer was never intended to spotlight our spirituality. But if that's our intention behind prayer, if that's all we're looking for, then that's our reward. God doesn't reward prayer like that. Jesus told in Luke chapter 18 a parable about prayer, and it contrasts two different types of people with two different clear motives for prayer. One is a Pharisee who comes again into the temple, into a public place like the synagogue, like the street corner, and he prays, God, I thank you that I'm not like those sinful people, those tax collectors, those immoral people, those extortioners, the unjust. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of everything I get. He was praying publicly for attention. He had his reward. But it says the tax collector, the second person in Jesus' parable, his story, stood far off. He wouldn't even look at heaven. And he just beat his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. He was off in the corner in private, but he was having a real connection with God. He wasn't spotlighting his spirituality. He was genuinely coming before the Lord in a place of solitude, not trying to draw attention to his own self-righteousness. And Jesus is going to say, we need to take a page from that tax collector's playbook and find our own private place, our small corner to pray. Listen to what he says next in verse six. But you, whenever you pray... Go into your room. Now, some translations use the word closet instead of the word room. And the word in Greek is actually temion, and temion was a storage room. Now, Sunday morning, I don't have all the graphics up behind me that I had on Sunday morning with PowerPoint, but I had a picture of a typical Jewish home in first century Israel. Typical homes were four-room homes. On the sides, they had a couple of rooms that were about eight feet wide and about 16 feet long on both sides of a central courtyard. So you'd walk in maybe through a front gate into a courtyard. There's two rectangular rooms on both sides and then one long ways across the back and sometimes a second, a fourth room on top of that back room and up there was a sleeping loft. Now the very back room was a living space. People would come to sit there. Children would sleep there. And it was a a place right connected to the courtyard where people would always have interaction with other people. It wasn't very private. But one of those side rooms was used for storage. And in that storage room, it was one that people would come into before as they were preparing meals. But throughout the day, there was more privacy. It wasn't exactly secret, but it was a little bit more separate. So a storage room 
It was an ideal setting for prayer. Jesus says, why don't you just go aside into your storage room? It's closed, it's convenient, but it was separate from the living space. You don't have to have a prayer room. There are stories of Jesus in Mark chapter 1 going out early in the morning. He gets up long before the crowds and even his own disciples can find him. And he goes out to the desert, to a solitary place, and that's where he prays. So maybe your solitary place is in the car as you're driving to work in the morning. Maybe your solitary place is a room in your home where no one will interrupt you. Maybe it's a spot in the yard. Maybe here in this desert, if you live close to the desert, it's taking a small walk or a hike uh, down a dirt road or down a path into the desert and literally finding a place to talk with God. But we all need one of those private places to go to, to have solitude. Jesus says, when you shut your door, when you're in the storeroom and you shut your door, pray to your father who's in the secret place. And the father who sees you in the secret place will reward you openly. <laughs> He'll give you reward, but you'll have that secret private experience. And it's unique to see that the father also is in the secret place because you and I, we can't see God. We can't look up and look into heaven. We don't get a window in. Now, heaven is a place with a lot of activity, uh, believers in past history, angels. But as far as our relationship with God, everyone in heaven isn't aware of that. Jesus is hidden. He's hidden from us, and he has that own private place to go and to relate, that secret place. And we are also in a secret place. And so it's as if two people in their own secret places are having this intimate, personal conversation I told a story Sunday morning about my wife, Christine, and I when we were in our dating years. And we had a long-distance relationship for about nine months uh, while we were dating. My wife went to a small Bible college in eastern Wyoming, and I was here in this area working as a youth pastor at a different local church. And throughout that time, we would make phone calls. And for me, it was easy to find a, a private place. I would go into my office or I would be in an apartment, uh, go into my room in an apartment, and so I could find a place to get away. I could find my secret place. But for my wife, it was a lot more difficult. There were always girls coming in and out of her dorm and in and out of her dorm room, and so being in her dorm was not exactly a, a private place for her to have a conversation with her boyfriend long distance. And they had a student center building, and that wasn't exactly an ideal place either. There's a lot of hustle and bustle. But inside of that student center, there was a storage closet. And my wife knew about that. And so frequently, she would go into the storage closet and shut the door. And from there, she could have a private, personal conversation. We could talk about what had been going on in our lives, and no one would come in and interrupt. Well, occasionally they would, because other people knew about the storage closet. So they were going to make a phone call to their boyfriend or their girlfriend from the same closet. But it was that secret place where we could get away and we could connect and we could relate with one another. And that's what Jesus is saying. Get a little privacy because with a little more privacy, you can have a little more open and intimate conversations. I put on the notes, secret places allow for more intimate and honest conversations. Because let's face it, what kind of prayers do we pray when we're in a public setting? God, thank you for the food. Thank you for the meal set on the table. Thank you for the blessings you put in my life. But we really don't want to pour out our souls before God. We don't want to talk about the things that are burdening us. We don't want to confess our faults. Not in a room full of people. We need a private place for that. And our relationship with God can go so much deeper, can get so much richer when we have solitude. And we're able to be open and honest and intimate in our conversation with God. He's already hidden in the secret place. What we say is going directly to him and nowhere else. But for us, we need that place of solitude. There's a second component that's important in prayer. We've touched on that briefly with the story of the Pharisee versus the tax collector praying in the temple, and there are two approaches. But that second aspect of secret prayer is sincerity. Jesus goes on in verse 7 of Matthew chapter 6. He says, And when you pray, don't use vain repetitions like the heathen do. Now, heathen, that's kind of a poor translation of this word. The word in Greek was ethnos, or we get the word ethnic or ethnic groups from that. But even our concept of ethnic groups is a little bit further removed from what Jesus was actually saying. We tend to associate ethnic groups with different races or even different skin colors of people. But the word ethnos Really, at its heart, it was talking about nations, but more specifically, people with different customs. 
Ethno is the Greek word for customs. So Jesus was saying, outside of Israel, outside of the Jewish people, there are people with other customs throughout the Roman Empire. And those people with those different customs, they approach prayer a little differently. They use vain repetitions. They think because of their specific wording or maybe their elaborate wording that their gods will listen or their goddesses will listen to them. Don't use repetition like the heathens do, like the people of other customs more correctly do. And again, prayers throughout the Roman world, they, they really relied on a specific formula for effectiveness. I want to read an excerpt from a, a first century Roman author, also a military commander. His name was Pliny the Elder. And here's what Pliny the Elder said about prayer in the Roman world at the time these gospels were written. He said, it's a general belief, this is again in the other nations, the other customs at the time, it's a general belief that without a certain form of prayer, sacrifice would be useless. If you don't have a specific format, then you might as well not even offer to the gods or the goddesses because it's pointless. He said, there's different forms of address to the deities. One, if you want to entreat them or ask for something of them. Another, if you want to avert their ire, in other words, they're angry at you and you want to shift their anger away from you. And another for commendations. If you want to praise them, there's another specific form. He says the supreme magistrates use certain formulas for their prayer. Not a single word can be omitted or pronounced out of its place. They were so specific that you had to say words correctly that they had books. And in these books was every single word of every single prayer type written. It was the duty of one person, Pliny says, to precede the dignitary by reading the formula before him from a written ritual. So one person is going through their ritual prayer book, reading the prayer word by word. Another person is keeping watch upon every word. So another person, as the dignitary recites it, recites what he heard, read from the book, another person's watching to see if he makes even one mistake. And a third person is in the room to make sure that everyone's silent. Because if people aren't silent, uh, you might get distracted. Or the god of the goddess might not hear every single word. They believe that if they misspoke even one word from the ritual prayer, that they would have to start over again. Because it was useless. It was ineffective. They were all about vain repetitions. Specific words. Exact words read for every single kind of prayer. Jesus even goes on to say, they think that they'll be heard for their many words. They think they'll be heard for their many words. And they would take special time out to butter up the gods and goddesses. Another Roman poet, Lucretius, he mentioned a prayer in his poetry to the goddess Venus. And he says this, Mother of Rome, delight of the gods and men, dear Venus, that beneath the gliding stars makes the widely traveled and fruitful land swarm with life, all living things through you alone are forever conceived. Stormy winds and massy clouds flee away from you, O goddess. For you the earth bears scented flowers. For you the waters of the deep smile. And the hollows of the peaceful sky glow with diffused radiance. He goes on and on and on and on and on with line after line after line of all of these praises. All of this flattery. <laughs> The more you say, the more you butter up the God or the goddess, the better they'll respond. But Jesus is telling us, God doesn't respond to flattery. God doesn't respond to formulas. What God wants is sincerity. Just get away to a private place and open up your mouth and start talking from your heart to God. That's what prayer should be. And it doesn't have to be complicated. In fact, the last thing that we'll take a look at this morning is simplicity. Simplicity. You know, God's even better than I am at anticipating things. He knows us as his children even better than I know my own kids. And I can get pretty good at anticipating my own kids, what they're going to need. I know that every single night before we get ready for bed, we have a routine and we read some stories and uh, do a few songs together before they get into bed. And every night, my kids want a sippy cup or a water bottle full of ice water to take to bed. Whenever my kids have neighbor friends over, if it's near lunch or it's near dinner, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're going to ask if their friends can stay and eat. 
And so before they even ask, I've already put in extra chicken nuggets and extra macaroni into the pan because I know we're going to be feeding five or six people instead of just three people. I know that. I can anticipate that. If it's a hot day, I know I'm going to get a request for popsicles and swimming pools to be set up in the backyard. If we go to Dollar Tree, I know each one of my kids is going to ask me for one dollar item from that store before we leave. I can anticipate their needs. But God goes far beyond anticipating. In verse 8, Jesus says, don't be like them. Again, the hypocrites, the pretenders, the people who are just praying the form prayers, the people who are trying to flatter God. For your father knows, and that word more accurately is sees. He sees ahead of time the things you have need of before you ask them. God doesn't just anticipate our needs. He knows every single need. He sees every necessity before we even open our mouth to ask. So we don't need to provide all the details. We don't need to give God paragraph after paragraph after paragraph to read him into all of our needs and explain everything to him. We can jump up into a prayer request in the middle, knowing that he already knows the background. We don't have to fill him in. So we can be simplistic and get right to the point with God. Jesus says in the next phrase, in this manner, therefore pray. He's saying, here's some basic elements of prayer. Now what Jesus follows with has become known as the Lord's Prayer. And it's common to recite that prayer. While not necessarily a bad thing to recite the prayer, Jesus didn't intend to give you magic words to say before God. He intended to give you different basic elements that fill out a, a complete, well-rounded prayer experience. He begins with this phrase, Our Father in heaven. Our Father in heaven. I'm going to come back to that in just a moment. But the next phrase, he says, Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. What does hallowed mean? <laughs> That's a term that we really don't use in, in today's English language. It was a, a term that was used hundreds of years ago, but it's not very familiar to us. And the best word that I could give you probably to give you an idea of where that word is headed is, is awe or awe-inspiring or in awe. So when Jesus says, pray, hallowed be your name, what he's saying is, bless God for the ways that he leaves you in awe of himself. So that's one component. That's one basic element of prayer. Blessing God for the ways he leaves us in awe. And I think people even leave us in awe in different ways. There are things about people when they go the extra mile that we have to appreciate. We have to commend them for. I remember years ago, I had a hot water heater go out in our home. And it was at a very busy time in our lives. And I called one of my friends who at the time was a plumber. And I said, I've got to get this water heater replaced. Can you help me out? And he said, well, our family is leaving on vacation in the morning. But I'll put my plans on hold. And I'll push our vacation back later in the day or the next day. And I'll come over in the morning and I'll, I'll help you replace your water heater. And I thought, wow, who would do that? Most people would say, you know, I'm sorry, I just can't help you out. But he's willing to put his vacation that he'd waited a while for on hold in order to help me with an urgent need in my life. Uh, that's an amazing thing. We also had an experience a few years back where uh, someone in our family was, well, their minivan had probably 180,000 miles on it at that point, but it still worked well. And so they could have sold it for two or $3,000 probably and, and gotten that out of it and put it toward the new vehicle that they were purchasing. But instead of that, they called us up and they said, would you like to have this minivan? Uh, it's still got some good life left in it. It's not in the greatest shape, but it, but it runs well and it's reliable. And they gave that van to us uh, shortly after our first child was born. And it helped us get through the last several years as a family. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. I was left in awe of that. And God does things all the time that leave us in awe of who he is. Maybe we look out in creation and we see some aspect of his creation that we've never noticed before, and it leaves us in awe. Maybe we see some way that God stepped into our life and answered a prayer, helped us out in the moment, or given us extra grace with some person, and what he's done leaves us in awe. That's an essential, it's a basic element of prayer. Praise you, God, because you've left me in awe. The next phrase Jesus says is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And in this phrase, we're essentially begging God to make his kingdom and his will become a reality 
on earth. That's the idea that, that's behind the, the terms come and be done. Both of those have an element of the word become in it. That's the idea behind it, the force behind this verse. And so we're saying, God, I want your kingdom to become a reality here in this world on earth. And I want your will to be accomplished here on this earth. And while God's kingdom coming to earth definitely refers to a future time in Bible prophecy when Christ will come back to the earth and rule from here, I think that it also refers to a point in time in life where we're living in right now, where we as God's kingdom here on earth, his kingdom representatives in this world, we're saying, God, I want, I want your uh, perspective. I want your truth to become a reality. I want your will to be done accomplished or your will to be accomplished on this earth right now through my life in the way that I live. Do your will here through me. And that's really the force behind this phrase. So we're saying, God, I want you to transform my life. Change me so that your will can be accomplished here among the people around me who intersect with my life. That's another element of prayer, praying for inner and personal change and outward personal change so that we can affect God's will in this world, the places that we go. Next, Christ says, give us this day our daily bread. So that's requesting the things that we need to sustain our bodies today. Give us what we need today, the food that we need, the supplies that we need. And all of us are in different places. Sometimes we're in a, a place where we have abundance and we forget to pray these prayers. And other times we're in a place of need. With the coronavirus, I was reading the other day that our, our unemployment rate as a nation is something like 10.2%. So one out of every 10 people is out of work at the moment. And while some of these people have some unemployment benefits that are coming in, for a lot of them, finances are still tight. And maybe that's you out there today. Maybe you're still dealing with things on a daily basis. And there are some days when you wake up and you wonder, am I going to have enough today? Prayer is an outlet for you. That's one of the purposes of prayer, to request the things that we need to sustain our lives and our bodies physically, day by day by day. Fourthly, Jesus says, forgive us our debts in verse 12 as we forgive our debtors. Now, this is talking about more than just money. Jesus is using it to refer to the people that sin against us and the people that we sin against. In fact, verses 14 and 15 further clarify that. He's talking about more than monetary debt. He's talking about confessing our shortcomings, our shortcomings and releasing blame. And that's an important purpose of prayer and another reason why we need these private places, the secret place. So we have a place where we can come before God and say, God, I really owe you. <laughs> Not that I could ever repay you, but I've offended you. I haven't done things right. I made some bad choices and decisions. And we confess that and say, God, this is my spiritual debt to you. I confess it. And then we also, in prayer, oftentimes remember people in our own lives, people who have offended us. And we take prayer as an opportunity to release our blame. God, instead of being vengeful, instead of uh, harboring resentment in my heart against this person, instead of trying to blame them, I'm just going to release it to you. You take care of that. And again, verses 14 and 15 in this passage in Matthew chapter 6, it says, If you forgive men their trespasses, their errors, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive men their trespasses, their offenses against you, their errors, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, it's not talking about an eternal lack of forgiveness where you'll stand before God one day and he'll say, You forgot to forgive this person in your life, so I'm never going to forgive you. It's talking about in our relationship because the whole focus of this prayer section is our relationship before God. And so what Jesus is saying is if we harbor blame against other people and resentment in our heart against people, we're not going to have an open fellowship with God. That's going to keep us distant. That vengeance that we want to take, that bitterness against someone is going to prevent us from having close fellowship with God. So if we want a close relationship with him, we have to constantly be confessing our faults and forgiving other people for the ways that they offend us to keep our relationship with God close. Verse 13, Jesus says, And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver or rescue us 
from the evil one. Don't lead us into temptation. And the word for temptation throughout the New Testament is a test. And sometimes these are tests that are prompted by Satan himself or by uh, the fact that our hearts are still sinful. We haven't received a, a recreated heart. The Holy Spirit's moved in, but we still have that sin nature that affects us, that tempts us. And so our prayer is, don't lead me into temptation. Don't lead me into any tests today. I had a professor in one of my college classes who would uh, spontaneously announce tests or quizzes at the beginning of the class. Most of the time it was a quiz. So we'd walk into class and every class period we would never know whether or not he was going to quiz us. And so we'd always be praying before we went into that class, please, Lord, no quiz today, no test today. And some days he'd say, pull out your pens, pull out your papers, there's a test, there's a quiz. And other days he'd say, no test today. And so what we're asking God for is, God, please, no test today. And I feel like there are some days, especially in our lives, when we feel like we can't handle another test. And on those days, maybe even more than others, we should pray, God, lead us not into temptation. Don't lead us into tests today. It's already been a difficult time in my life. So please protect us from that. But then the next phrase goes hand in hand because sometimes he does allow tests to come our way. And so it fits, but deliver, rescue us from the evil one. And so if you allow a test today, God, and if this test is orchestrated by my sin nature or by Satan, by the evil one, by evil in this world, rescue me out of that. Give me a way out. Give me a way to pass the test or to get out and to escape the test. And we know sometimes God does allow tests to come our way. We read in scripture about people like Job, who is doing seemingly everything right. And Satan came before God one day and said, Job would curse you if things start to go a little less right in his life. If more bad things happen, he'll walk away from you. And so God said, okay, spare his life, but you can bring calamity upon him and we'll see what happens. And thankfully, Job remained faithful. We read in Matthew chapter four about Jesus being led by the Holy Spirit of God into the wilderness to be tempted, to be tested by the devil. And so we know that's a reality, but our prayer is, God, no test today, but if they come, rescue us from the evil one. Help us to pass the test, to remain faithful to you throughout the test. Jesus finishes the Lord's prayer with this phrase, for the kingdom and the power and the glory is yours forever. Amen. And so the prayer is wrapped up with this, in a sense, recognizing this recognition that all plans and power and praise ultimately belong to God. God, I have these plans in my life, but I submit them to you because you're the God who has the plan. Your plan is the ultimate plan. And so I submit my plans to you. I think I've got this figured out. I think I have power in this area. But God, you're the one who really has the power and who can give me strength to make it through the things that I can't muster enough strength up in my own power for. So God, you strengthen me for those things. And maybe sometimes we are tempted to praise ourselves, pat ourselves on the back and think, wow, we, we did a pretty good job today. But ultimately, the praise, it's because God, he made us. He created us in the first place. And, and every good and perfect gift that comes into our life, we're told in James comes from the Father of lights, the Father in heaven, who doesn't change. His nature is always consistent. So every good thing that comes into our life, God ultimately deserves praise for. And every good thing that we accomplish is because he gave us life and breath in the first place. And so really, the culmination of prayer is saying, God, you're the one that's worthy of praise. It's your plan, work your plan. It's your power that we need and it's you who ultimately deserves the praise for the good things in our lives. So that's uh, a model for prayer. Those basic concepts uh, are things, those basic elements are different aspects that we can incorporate into our own prayer to make it more well-rounded. And finally, we see that we can pray with boldness. I mentioned we come back to that phrase, our Father in heaven. And a relationship between a father and a child it's a different kind of relationship. It's one where we can really put anything on the table. We can have open conversations, hopefully, without fear of repercussions or fear of an immediate lecture or fear of 
being dismissed or looked down on. It's an open relationship. We can put anything on the table. I have some very open and honest conversations with my kids. And I'm really thankful when they ask vulnerable questions. And sometimes, especially my daughters who are older children, they will ask some very vulnerable questions or very open and honest questions. And I feel honored when they do those things. They also feel like they can ask me for anything. And sometimes that's even to a fault. My oldest daughter has come up with some pretty bold requests. There was a point in time a few months ago when she asked for an entire room of our house to be given to her so she could put her dolls and the things that she has for her dolls, her doll bed, and the things that she makes out of scraps around the house or extra boxes for her dolls. She wanted to be able to fill an entire room of our house with her dolls. And I had to answer no on that one because we don't just have a lot of extra rooms in our house that we can devote to my daughter's doll collection and everything that she builds for that. There was another time when we were talking about birthday parties and she asked, can we rent out the city pool for my birthday party? Well, the city pool is almost $200 to rent for two hours. And so I said, we probably can't do that. But the fact that she was willing and open to put any request on the table was something that I think is important for a child to have with their father. And really, that's the relationship that we have with God the Father. We can put any request on the table. And he answers in our best interest. And he doesn't always answer affirmative. He doesn't always give us what we ask for. And sometimes that's a good thing. But we can bring anything before him. We can pray with boldness. Put any request on the table. And there's a couple of aspects of Jesus' prayer that remind us of that boldness. One is saying our Father in heaven, coming to him as his spiritual children. In fact, in John 1, we find out that we come into that relationship. It says, Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, but the world did not know him. He came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So it's our faith in Jesus Christ, who he is, the promised Savior of God, God in the flesh, the one who took all of our sins, all of our offenses against God on himself on the cross, took our punishment that we deserve for sin in our place through death and provides us with his righteousness, his perfection in God's sight put into our personal accounts, into our standing before God through simply believing in him, that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, the way to heaven We're brought into a relationship with God. God becomes our father. And because of that, we can enter in before him with boldness. Hebrews 4 verse 16 says, Let's with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, God's throne in heaven, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in times of need. Mercy is not receiving the things that we do deserve. Grace is getting stuff that we don't deserve. And God provides both of those as we, with confidence, with boldness, can draw close to his throne in heaven and enter before him because it's a relationship of a child to a father. We can pray in these ways, but we can pray with an unusual boldness before God. I want to summarize the things that we've talked about this morning with three different steps, three different action steps that we might take. And again, all these refer back to elements uh, of the past Uh, sections of this Sermon on the Mount. First of all, maybe one thing that we can do in response to these truths today is to create a way to withdraw from the activity of life. Here's how I'm going to get away. To pursue a consistent, intimate conversations with God in our secret place. Maybe it's a storage room. Maybe it's our car. Maybe it's a place we go for walks in the morning. But what is that secret place where we can have intimate, honest conversation with God? It's important to have solitude so we can open up before our Creator. Secondly, understand God's not concerned with formality or lengthy prayers, but rather just with sincerity. If you feel like you don't know the right things to say when you pray, or you can't pray long enough, That's not important to God. You don't have to flatter him or butter him up about with everything that you know about him. He just wants your heart. And so enter into a conversation. Consider him a friend and just go out to talk. Thirdly, enhance your prayer life by incorporating some of the basic elements from Jesus' model prayer that we talked about. 
It's more than just a repetitious prayer. It's more than just something that we should repeat on a consistent basis. It's an example that teaches us six basic elements that can make our prayer life a well-rounded experience where we're coming before God and we're confessing certain things and we're standing in awe of God and we're setting aside our life before God and we're saying, God, I need you to make these changes in my life and we're bringing requests before him. All these are important elements of prayer and we can enhance our prayer experience by working them in on a more consistent basis. Thank you for joining us. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we thank you again for these opportunities to take a look at prayer. Prayer is something we talk about all the time as Christians, as followers of you. But sometimes it's good to get back to the basics, to realize we do need to get away, to realize prayer is a simple thing. It is something that's more about sincerity than about repetition. And to realize that prayer is more than just asking you for requests or, or thanking you for the food on the table. It's a relationship, an ongoing experience where you shape us, God, and you show us things. And you provide your power to work in our lives and in the lives of others that we care about. And so we pray that our prayer expense, experience would be a powerful one as a result of implementing some of these simple truths from your Sermon on the Mount. In Jesus' name, amen.